जो तस्वीरें आ रही हैं वो इंटरनेशनल कोर्ट ऑफ जस्टिस में हेग जो नीदरलैंड्स में वहाँ से तस्वीरें हैं और ये भी कहा गया है कोर्ट की तरफ से अंजलि के ये पाकिस्तान ने वियना कन्वेंशन को तोड़ा है इंटरनेशनल कोर्ट ने ये कहा है रजिस्ट्री ऑफ एन एप्लीकेशन बाय द रिपब्लिक ऑफ इंडिया अगेंस्ट द इस्लामिक रिपब्लिक ऑफ पाकिस्तान अलेजिंग वायोलेशन ऑफ द इस्लामिक रिपब्लिक ऑफ पाकिस्तान अलेजिंग वायोलेशन फॉर अप्रैल 1963 टू व्हिच आई विल रिफर एज द वियना कन्वेंशन अकॉर्डिंग टू द एप्लीकेशन ऑफ इंडिया एंड आई कोट in the matter of the detention and trial of an indian national mr kulbushan sudhir jadav end of quote accused of performing acts of espionage and terrorism on behalf of india and sentenced to death by a military court in pakistan in april in april 2017 As is usual I shall not read the introductory paragraphs of the judgment which set out the procedural history of the case and reproduce the submissions of the parties nor shall I read the paragraphs which describe the factual background to the case I shall also omit or summarize some paragraphs of the judgment The full text of the judgment will of course be available at the close of the sitting. I shall accordingly begin reading of the judgment at paragraph 33. With regard to jurisdiction, India seeks to found the court's jurisdiction on article 36 paragraph 1 of the statute and on article 1 of the optional protocol to the Vienna Convention on consular relations concerning the compulsory settlement of disputes to which i will refer as the optional protocol india and pakistan have been parties to the vienna convention since 28 december 1977 and 14 may 1969 respectively they also were at the time of the filing of the application parties to the optional protocol without any reservations or declarations the court notes that pakistan has not contested that the dispute relates to the interpretation and application of the vienna convention and that the present dispute concerns the question of consular assistance with regard to the arrest detention trial and sentencing of mr jadab the court also notes that in its application written pleadings and final submissions india asks the court to declare that pakistan has violated mr jadab's and i quote elementary human rights which were which are also to be given effect as mandated under article 14 of the 1966 international covenant on civil and political rights end of quote the covenant entered into force for india on 10 july 1979 and for pakistan on 23 september 2010 in this respect the court observes that its jurisdiction in the present case arises from article 1 of the optional protocol and therefore does not extend to the determination of breaches of international law obligations other than those under the vienna convention this conclusion does not preclude the court from taking into account other obligations under international law in so far as they are relevant to the interpretation of the vienna convention in light of the foregoing the court finds 
that it has jurisdiction under Article 1 of the Optional Protocol to entertain India's claims based on alleged violations of the Vienna Convention. The court now turns to admissibility of the to the admissibility of the application. Pakistan has raised three objections to the admissibility of India's application. These objections are based on India's alleged abuse of process, abuse of rights, and unlawful conduct. The court addresses each of these objections in turn. In its first objection to the admissibility of India's application, Pakistan asks the court to rule that India has abused the court's procedures. <clears throat> Pakistan advances two main arguments to this end. First, it alleges that when requesting the indication of provisional measures on 8 May 2017, India failed to draw the court's attention to the existence of a constitutional right to lodge a clemency petition. Secondly, Pakistan submitted that before instituting proceedings on 8 May 2017, India had failed to give consideration to other dispute settlement mechanisms envisaged in Articles 2 and 3 of the optional protocol. The court observes in relation to Pakistan's first argument that in its order indicating provisional measures, it took into account the possible consequences for Mr. Jadavi's situation of the availability under Pakistani law of any appeal or petition procedure, including the clemency petition to which Pakistan refers in support of its claim. In this regard, the court concluded inter alia, and I quote, that there was considerable uncertainty as to when a decision on any appeal or petition could be rendered, and if the sentence is maintained, as to when Mr. Jadav could be executed, end of quote. Therefore, there is no basis to conclude that India abused its procedural rights when requesting the court to indicate provisional measures in this case. In relation to the second argument, the court notes that none of the provisions of the optional protocol relied on by Pakistan contain preconditions to the court's exercise of its jurisdiction. The court interpreted these provisions in the case concerning United States diplomatic and consular staff in Tehran, where it ruled that Articles 2 and 3 of the optional protocol to the Vienna Convention on diplomatic relations and to the Vienna Convention on consular relations do not lay down, and I quote, a precondition of the applicability of the precise and categorical provision contained in Article 1 establishing the compulsory jurisdiction of the court in respect of disputes arising out of the interpretation or application of the Vienna Convention in question. Articles 2 and 3 provide only that as a substitute for recourse to the court, the parties may agree upon resort either to arbitration or to conciliation, end of quote. It follows that India was under no obligation in the present case to consider other dispute settlement mechanisms prior to instituting proceedings before the court on 8 May 2017. 
Thus, Pakistan's objection based on the alleged non-compliance by India with Articles 2 and 3 of the Optional Protocol cannot be upheld. The Court recalls that only in exceptional circumstances should it reject a claim based on a va valid title of jurisdiction on the ground of abuse of process. In this regard, there has to be clear evidence that the applicant's conduct amounts to an abuse of process. The court does not consider that in the present case there are such exceptional circumstances that would warrant rejecting India's claims on the ground of abuse of process. Accordingly, the court finds that Pakistan's first objection to the admissibility of India's application must be rejected. With regard to the second objection to the admissibility of India's application, Pakistan requests the court to rule that India has abused various rights it has under international law. In its pleadings, Pakistan has based this objection on three main arguments. First, it refers to India's refusal to provide evidence of Mr. Jadavi's Indian nationality by means of his actual passport in his real name, even though it has a duty to do so. Secondly, Pakistan mentions India's failure to engage with its request for assistance in relation to the criminal investigations into Mr. Jadavi's activities. Thirdly, Pakistan alleges that India authorized Mr. Jadav to cross the Indian border with, I quote, a false cover name, authentic passport, end of quote, in order to conduct espionage and terrorist activities. In relation to these arguments, Pakistan invokes various counter-term terrorism obligations set out in Security Council Resolution 1373 of 2001. In its judgment on the preliminary objections in the case concerning immunities and criminal proceedings, the court ruled that abuse of rights cannot be invoked as a ground of inadmissibility when the establishment of the right in question is properly a matter for the merits. The court notes, however, that by raising the argument that India has not provided the court with the actual passport in Mr. Jadavi's real name, Pakistan appears to suggest that India has failed to prove Mr. Jadavi's nationality. This argument is relevant to the claims based on Article 36 of the Vienna Convention in relation to Mr. Jadav and therefore must be addressed at this stage. In this respect, the Court observes that the evidence before it shows that both parties have considered Mr. Jadav to be an Indian national. Indeed, Pakistan has so described Mr. Jadav on various occasions, including in its letter of assistance for criminal investigation against the Indian national Kulbu Shan Sudair Jadav, addressed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Pakistan on 23 January 2017 to the High Commission of India in Islamabad. Consequently, the court is satisfied that the evidence before it leaves no room for doubt that Mr. Jadav is of Indian nationality. 
As already indicated, the second and third argument is advanced by Pakistan in support of its second objection to the admissibility of the application are based on various alleged breaches of India's obligations under Security Council Resolution 1373 of 2001. In particular, Pakistan refers to India's failure to respond to Pakistan's request for mutual legal assistance with its criminal investigations into Mr. Jadavi's espionage and terrorism activities, as well as the issuance of what Pakistan <coughs> describes as, and I quote, a false cover name, authentic passport, end of quote. The court observes that, in essence, Pakistan seems to argue that India cannot request consular assistance with respect to Master Jadav, while at the same time it has violated other obligations under international law as a result of the aforementioned acts. While Pakistan has not clearly explained the link between these allegations and the rights invoked by India on the merits, it is the court's view that such allegations are properly a matter for the merits and therefore cannot be invoked as a ground of inadmissibility. For these reasons, the court finds that Pakistan's second objection to the admissibility of India's application must be rejected. The second and third arguments advanced by Pakistan will be addressed later when dealing with the merit. The court now turns to the third objection to the admissibility of India's application whereby Pakistan asks the court to dismiss the application on the basis of India's alleged unlawful conduct. Relying on the doctrine of clean hands and the principles of ex turbi causa non oritur axio and ex injuria jus non oritur, Pakistan contends that India has failed to respond to its request for assistance with the investigation into Mr. Jadavi's activities, that it has provided him with, I quote, a false cover name, authentic passport, end of quote, and more generally, that it is responsible for Mr. Jadavi's espionage and terrorism activities in Pakistan. The court does not consider that an objection based on the clean hand doctrine may by itself render an application based on a valid title of jurisdiction inadmissible. It recalls that in the case concerning certain Iranian assets, Islamic Republic of Iran versus United States of America, the court ruled that even if it were shown that the applicant's conduct was not beyond reproach, this would not be sufficient per se to uphold the objection to admissibility raised by the respondent on the basis of the clean hands doctrine. The court therefore concludes that Pakistan's objection based on the said doctrine must be rejected. The court further notice that Pakistan has relied on the judgment of the Permanent Court of International Justice in the factory at Chorso case in order to advance an argument based on a principle to which it refers as ex turbi causa non oritur axio. However, in that case, the Permanent Court referred to a principle, and I quote, 
generally accepted in the jurisprudence of international arbitration, as well as by municipal courts, that one party cannot avail himself of the fact that the other has not fulfilled some obligation. If the former party has, by some illegal act, prevented the latter from fulfilling the obligation in question, end of quote. With regard to this principle, the court is of the view that Pakistan has not explained how any of the wrongful acts allegedly committed by India may have prevented Pakistan from fully fulfilling its obligation in respect of the provision of consular assistance to Mr. Jadab. The court therefore finds that Pakistan's objection based on the principle of ex turbi causa non oritur axio cannot be upheld. This finding leads the court to a similar conclusion with regard to the principle of ex injuria jus non oritur, which stands for the proposition that unlawful conduct cannot modify the law applicable in the relations between the parties. In the view of the court, this principle is in opposite to the circumstances of the present case. Accordingly, the court finds that Pakistan's third objection to the admissibility of India's application must be rejected. In light of the foregoing, the court concludes that the three objections to the admissibility of the application raised by Pakistan must be rejected and that India's application is admissible. The court now turns to the merits of India's application. In this regard, the court recalls that Pakistan does not expressly raise any objection to the jurisdiction of the court. It notes, however, that Pakistan does advance several contentions concerning the applicability of certain provisions of the Vienna Convention to the case of Mr. Jadab. The court considers it appropriate to address these arguments first before turning to the alleged violations by Pakistan of its obligations under Article 36 of the Vienna Convention. The court notes that Pakistan's contentions regarding the applicability of the Vienna Convention are threefold. First, Pakistan argues that Article 36 of the Vienna Convention does not apply in prima facie cases of espionage. Secondly, Pakistan contends that customary international law governs cases of espionage in consular relations and allows states to make exceptions to the provisions on consular access contained in Article 36 of the Vienna Convention. Thirdly, Pakistan maintains that it is the 2008 agreement on consular access between India and Pakistan, rather than Article 36 of the Vienna Convention, which regulates consular access in the present case. The court will address each of these arguments in turn. With regard to Pakistan's first contention, the court begins by noting that India is not a party to the 1969 Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, whereas Pakistan signed that convention on 29 April 1970, but has not ratified it. Accordingly, the court will interpret the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations according to the customary rules of treaty interpretation, which, as it has stated on many occasions, 
are reflected in Articles 31 and 32 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. The Court observes that neither Article 36 nor any other provision of the Vienna Convention contains a reference to cases of espionage, nor does Article 36 exclude from its scope when read in its context and in light of the object and purpose of the Convention, certain categories of persons such as those suspected of espionage. The object and purpose of the Vienna Convention, as stated in its preamble, is to, I quote, contribute to the development of friendly relations among nations, end of quote. The purpose of Article 36, Paragraph 1 of the Convention, as indicated in its introductory sentence, is to, I quote, facilitate the exercise of consular functions relating to nationalists of the sending state, end of quote. Consequently, consular officers may in all cases exercise the rights relating to consular access set out in that provision for the nationalists of the sending state. It would run counter to the purpose of that provision if the rights it provides could be disregarded when the receiving state alleges that a foreign national in its custody was involved in acts of espionage. The court thus concludes that when interpreted in accordance with the ordinary meaning to be given to the terms of the Vienna Convention in their context and in light of its object and purpose, Article 36 of the Convention does not exclude from its scope certain categories of persons such as those suspected of espionage. In view of this conclusion, the court need not, in principle, re resort to supplementary means of interpretation, such as the travaux preparatoires of the Vienna Convention and the circumstances of its conclusion, to determine the meaning of Article 36 of the Convention. However, as in other cases, the court may have recourse to the travaux preparatoires in order to confirm its interpretation of Article 36 of the Vienna Convention. During the discussions of the International Law Commission on the topic of consular intercourse and immunities, there was no suggestion that Article 36 would not apply to certain categories of persons, such as those suspected of espionage. Draft Article 30A, which served as a basis for Article 36 of the Convention, was discussed by the Commission in 1960. It provided in the relevant part, and I quote, that the local authorities shall inform the Consul of the sending state without delay when any national of that state is detained in custody within his district. Among the issues discussed in relation to this provision was the question whether and to what extent it was conceivable for consular notification to be made without delay in countries which had a system of detention incommunicado whereby the person might be held isolated from the outside world for a certain period beginning at the beginning of a criminal investigation. With regard to cases of espionage, the chairman of the commission remarked that, and I quote, a statement of a general principle of law could not possibly cover all conceivable cases. If the Commission went into the question of whether cases of espionage should be made an exception, 
the whole principle of consular protection and communication with nationals would have to be reopened. End of quote. तो ये हम हेग की अंतर्राष्ट्रीय अदालत में फैसला सुन रहे थे भारत के लिए कुलभूषण यादव मामले में The court further noticed that cases of espionage were also mentioned in the context of the Commission's discussions on the possible inclusion of a reference to security zones in the proposed provision. However, there was no suggestion of consular access not being granted in cases of espionage because of national security concerns. During its 1961 session, the Commission decided to change the words without delay to without undue delay. The Court observes that this decision had no implication for the scope of, article, of draft Article 36. The Commission's commentary to draft Article 36, paragraph 1b, merely states that, and I quote, the expression without undue delay used in paragraph 1b allows for cases where it is necessary to hold a person incommunicado for a certain period for the purposes of the criminal investigation, end of quote. During the United Nations Conference on Consular Relations held in Vienna from 4 March to 22 April 1963, the question of espionage was raised in relation to the words without undue delay in draft Article 36. The chairman invited Mr. Zurek, the former special rapporteur of the International Law Commission on this topic, to explain why, international law, why the International Law Commission had included the words without undue delay in its draft. The explanation given by Mr. Zurek suggests that while the charge of espionage was thought to be relevant in determining the appropriate period of time within which notification to the sending state should be made by the receiving state, cases of espionage were not excluded from the scope of the Vienna Convention. The court further noticed that in the course of the discussion on proposed amendments to draft Article 36, including a proposal by the United Kingdom to delete the word undue from the phrase without undue delay, which was eventually adopted, it was not suggested that certain categories of persons, such as those suspected of espionage, were to be excluded from the protection of the Convention. The Travaux Préparatoires thus confirm the interpretation that Article 36 does not exclude from its scope certain categories of persons, such as those suspected of espionage. Turning now to Pakistan's second argument regarding the existence of an alleged espionage exception under customary international law, the court notes that the preamble of the Vienna Convention states that the rules of customary international law continue to govern matters not expressly regulated by the provisions of the present Convention. Article 36 of the Convention expressly regulates the question of consular access to and communication with nationalists of descending state and makes no exception with regard to cases of espionage. The Court recalls that India and Pakistan have been parties to the Vienna Convention 
since 1977 and 1969, respectively, and that neither party attached any reservation or declaration to the provisions of the Convention. The Court therefore considers that Article 36 of the Convention and not customary international law governs the matter at hand in the relations between the parties. Having reached this conclusion, the Court does not find it necessary to determine whether when the Vienna Convention was adopted in 1963, there existed the rule of customary international law that Pakistan advances. The Court will now turn to Pakistan's third contention that the 2008 Agreement on Consular Access between India and Pakistan governs consular access in the present case. The Court recalls that point six of the 2000 Agreement provides that, and I quote, in case of arrest, detention, or sentence made on political or security grounds, each side may examine the case on its merits, end of quote. It also recalls that in the preamble of the Agreement, the parties declared that they were, and I quote, desirous of furthering the objective of humane treatment of nationalists of either country arrested, detained, or imprisoned in the other country, end of quote. The court is of the view that point six of the argument, of the agreement, cannot be read as denying consular access in the case of an arrest, detention, or sentence made on political or security grounds. Given the importance of the rights concerned in guaranteeing the humane treatment of nationalists of either country, arrested, detained, or imprisoned in the other country, if the parties had intended to restrict in some way the right is guaranteed by Article 36, one would expect such an intention to be unequivocally reflected <coughs> in the provisions of the agreement. That's not the case here. <coughs> 